Our session is called uh, Energy and Climate Change, and I just want to remind everyone that while these two issues are closely related, climate change is due to more than energy. And in particular, roughly speaking, one quarter of greenhouse gases comes from agriculture and changes in land use. And so when we think about climate change, we should not only think about energy. We have to think about energy is important, but we have to think about uh, other sources of greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, we all heard last night uh, Laurent Fabius talk to us about uh, uh, the urgency of dealing with climate change, according to him, and he's been involved in an intimate way now for at least 10 years. Um, he uh, reported on the latest IPCC report, um, which I have not read. I've only learned about it from a few uh, newspaper articles and what he said last night. Uh, but it, uh, two things surprised me about uh, what I have not read, but have heard about. Uh, one is its specificity. I followed the science of climate change for at least two decades, and uh, as an interested observer, not as a scientist. And um, there's still huge uncertainties, including the sensitive sensitivity, it's called, of the climate itself to greenhouse gas concentrations in the climate. They have not changed in 25 years, one and a half degrees centigrade to four and a half degrees centigrade for a doubling of CO2 from uh, roughly 1800. Um, so we've invested tens of billions of dollars in research on climate change. We know much more than we did 20 years ago. And one of the things we know is how complicated the Earth's atmosphere and oceans are. Uh, so that in spite of all of this greater research, and we're much better informed on individual pieces, we still do not have an accurate overview of uh, climate change and its relation to greenhouse gas emissions. So I was given that background, I was surprised at the specificity that was reported, at least, uh, again, I haven't read the report, but uh, reported in the newspapers and in Fabius's uh, speech last night. And uh, in order to get, get that specificity, they had to make a lot of assumptions about things that we actually don't know about. They may be completely right in those assumptions. I don't have a judgment on it, but they may be also badly wrong. And so we should not take that as firm knowledge about the climate, um, even from the accomplished scientists. The other thing that surprised me, this, this is uh, again from newspaper articles and Fabius' speech, is the degree of urgency which was uh, conveyed apparently to the readers of the report, um, and maybe by the report itself, and uh, statements about 2030. And I will just say flatly, as a practicing economist for a half a century, that uh, that will not happen by 2030. So we should get it out of our heads that no, we're not going to turn society over on the, uh, around the world over the issue of climate change. It's not, just not going to happen. Now what might happen is that we overshoot and then technological improvements permit us to go back down to two, that one and a half. I don't rule that out. But the notion of stabilizing the uh, average temperature increase at one and a half degrees centigrade by 2030 is just out of the question in my view. Um, and um, uh, so we need to think about uh, much more actively if, if the scientists are right in, the, in what they say, much more actively about adaptation along many, many different fronts 
not just building seawalls, <laughs> but with biodiversity and so forth. The human agency can uh, adapt the, uh, of all of the species. The most adaptable are probably human beings, some ants, and some bacteria. Uh, but the human beings have an enormous capacity for adaptation to change, particularly if there's notice about when the change is coming, as we have increasingly. Um, uh, so I think it's, um, I guess I would say, bad politics to urge strongly that we do something that's going to be impossible. That sounds like Mr. Trump. He actually has some things in mind, not climate change, but other things which I think are impossible. Um, now, my view on the trajectory, um, sp sp talking just about the energy side, I know that a number of environmentalists, at least in the United States and I gather in Europe, also deeply regret the shale gas revolution on the grounds that it's another fossil fuel and it uh, generates greenhouse gases. And of course they are correct in their factual statement, but per unit of useful energy, uh, natural gas in producing electricity produces about half the greenhouse gases as coal does. So the, um, uh, my trajectory for the, not the next decade, because I think it's impossible, but say for the next three decades, is uh, natural gas as the bridging incremental fuel and solar as the ultimate source of energy supplemented by wind and other things, ge geothermal, but the main source will be solar. And if we've heard from the previous presentations, the uh, uh, cost of solar energy has come down dramatically uh, just within the last uh, decade. And so basically, in the short run, uh, the thing we need to do is, above all, prevent the building of new coal-fired power plants, That's, uh, uh, which is strongly uh, 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 against climate change and, of course, heavily polluting. And then there's the question of what we do with existing power plants those that ha still have economic value, and uh, that's an issue certainly for private firms, as in the United States and some other countries, but even for state ownership of uh, coal-fired power plants. And that's a, uh, an important budgetary decision. Uh, do the coal-fired power plants, which have very low operating costs, once the capital costs have been incurred, and they last for 40 or 50 years, uh, are they going to be taken out of production? And can we have an international agreement on that? Probably not. Can we have an international understanding that it would be desirable? Probably uh, feasible, leaving aside Mr. Trump for the moment. Um, and, um, and then it would be up to individual countries uh, whether the extent to which they accelerate the um, uh, shutting down of existing coal-fired power plants. But above all, we have to stop building new ones. And uh, 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 we have not built any coal-fired, uh, coal is still very important in the United States, but we have not built any new plants for the last 35 years. Uh, all the incremental power has been uh, achieved by natural gas, which has much it's a higher operating costs, but much lower capital costs uh, to build. And uh, we've expanded some existing coal-fired plants, but we've built no new ones. And uh, all, as I say, all of the incremental, uh, apart from a modest amount of solar and wind and those uh, those renewables. Um, and um, and then if the uh, we're bridging a period with natural gas to solar, the issue comes up, which has been emphasized by uh, our previous speaker, uh, electricity storage. I'm glad she did not use the word batteries, because batteries are one form 
of electricity storage, chemical storage basically, uh, but there are other forms of electric storage. Batteries, uh, what we could call batteries in general, are perhaps necessary for electric vehicles uh, uh, which move around, uh, but they're not necessary for stationary sources of power. And the true traditional ways of storing electricity, uh, think of wind and solar when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, um, are pumping water. And uh, of course that only works if you have a lot of water, which you can pump. And um, flywheels. Flywheels have been understood for many, many years. They're relatively cheap to build. To build a really first class one requires special materials, but to build ordinary ones are cheap to build and you can imagine under any uh, wind uh, turbine or a collection of wind turbines, uh, flywheels uh, around which store the electricity and which can be drawn on uh, during when the wind is not uh, blowing. Um, uh, 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 for mobile uh, things like cars and trucks and airplanes, uh, of course batteries are, uh, uh, are much more important in the traditional sense and probably mostly chemical unless we go to hydrogen as a um, fuel. Uh, I have long favored under the heading of climate change uh, nuclear power, so I'm not a conventional environmentalist in that sense, uh, but as we've saw, seen today, uh, nuclear power is now outclassed in terms of cost unless we get uh, new, uh, smaller, modular uh, nuclear power plants which have been designed down the river from me at MIT and in other places, we, we, we have not seen them yet in commercial use and so they remain to be uh, tested. I saw recently a press report on fusion saying that fusion, practical fusion, commercial fusion was uh, five years away. I'm old enough to know that uh, it's been said that fusion was just within a two decades since the mid 1950s and I simply don't believe it. Believe it. Um, yeah. And I'm not willing to put more money in it but, as a taxpayer, uh, but uh, some people are apparently, so we're still working on fusing, uh, but I don't see fusion as a practical uh, um, operation in this. And I guess in uh, talking about timing, I'm persuaded of the tremendous inertia in human affairs, uh, even in a rapidly growing economy like China uh, and now India and more slowly growing in Europe and the United States. Um, we have a lot of legacy uh, capital stock, very large uh, in the uh, United States and Europe, but uh, uh, even in China, uh, we heard in uh, an interview today that there are now nine million cars in the, United, in the world um, from Goshen, nine million cars. In the United States, the average car lasts uh, eight years. That's the average. I drove a car once for 14 years from the time it was made until the time I sold it, actually. Didn't junk it, I sold it. Um, so uh, think about converting uh, those nine million cars, all internal combustion engines, into uh, uh, climate change friendly vehicles. If we were to stop producing internal combustion engines this year, and from January on produced only electric cars, only electric cars, it would take uh, uh, nearly two decades to replace the outstanding stock of cars, and there are also trucks and other um, vehicles. Um, and then I want to remind everyone, I'm sure everyone knows here, 
you cannot just look at the vehicles that are electric, you have to look behind it to how the electricity was generated. And we still generate um, most of our electricity with fossil fuels. And uh, so you have to look at the entire cycle and not just the fact that the car is uh, electric. Let me say a word about uh, Mr. Trump and his uh, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. It happened by coincidence. He, he announced his intention to withdraw uh, in June of 2017. And as you probably know, it actually takes three years to formally withdraw. So he announced his intention to withdraw. Uh, two weeks later, we had an annual conference of mayors. Uh, it's an annual conference. Two weeks later, representing 1,400 cities, uh, all of the largest cities in the United States. And the conference of mayors, Republicans and Democrats, voted overwhelmingly that they were not giving up on addressing climate change. Now it has to be said that many cities do not have a climate change policy, but uh, surprisingly perhaps, many US cities, including mine, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, do have a climate policy. And the Conference of Mayors in direct reaction to Tr Trump's announcement have uh, announced that they were gonna carry on. And of course, we know some states, California, uh, up front, but that includes Massachusetts and other uh, U.S. states are going to carry on with climate change. And the time dimension of this uh, issue, problem, challenge, is such that um, Trump will come and go uh, before it's been solved uh, seriously. And so uh, I do not, uh, Trump can do a lot of damage as uh, president, but it's not mainly in this area. Things are going to carry on. They're going to be driven mainly by market phenomenon. Well, we've talked about the changing cost structure for solar and, and uh, uh, wind and nuclear and coal. Um, and um, so I, I'm, I, that, that's not high on my priority list of things that uh, the damage that Trump um, um, can actually do. Um, well, I, I have. Uh, lots more I can say, but that's probably time to stop and we can talk about other things in conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cooper. Um, as you say, this uh, IPCC's 1.5 degree C special report was uh, just uh, released and uh, they are very uh, kind of uh, um, ambitious or really surprisingly tough and speci uh, very specificity there uh, and to make um, net zero emission by 2050 is necessary and and uh, compared to the two degrees Celsius scenario we need three times or four times more investment needed and uh, as you say if overshooting happens uh, definitely the carbon capture and storage or usage will be the key technology to achieve uh, net zero emission by that time so so carbon storage and capture is, is really uh, technology is there, but without carbon price or carbon tax or some kind of penalty on carbon, this is very difficult. So the United States uh, uh, in, in some companies has carbon pricing and, and reducing the carbon contents. But this carbon capture technology, it's only possible in Saudi Arabia or this oil producing country as an enhanced oil recovery. But just burning coal and take out carbon dioxide and, and put it underground is probably almost impossible. So now the other technology, direct carbon capture from the air is also discussed. So the thing is, but this is another very high cost. Um, other things is, yes, battery of the electric vehicle as a system. If there's a millions of uh, electric vehicles on, uh, uh, on the market or on the street, that they could be connected and they can provide the gigawatts of storage as a system. So that is the, one of the uh, Chinese strategy or some of the uh, EV com companies are uh, thinking about. It's a digitalization 
and connectivity solve part of this storage problem. Fusion, interesting. I learned some of the Fusion company in the United States are really ambitious and some money venture capitalists put in. I hope one of them may work, but uh, we'll see. Um, that's, that's a part of my comment.